rapture fourth factor of enlightenment piti or rapture has the characteristic of happiness delight and satisfaction it is in itself a mental state possessing these characteristics but a further characteristic of rapture is that it can pervade associated mental states making them delightful and happy and bringing a sense of deep satisfaction lightness and agility rapture fills the mind and body with lightness and agility this according to the classical analysis is its function the mind becomes light and energized the body also feels agile light and workable the manifestation of rapture is in actual sensations of lightness in the body rapture manifests very clearly through physical sensations when rapture occurs coarse and uncomfortable sensations are replaced with something very soft and gentle you may feel such a lightness of body that it seems as if you are floating in the air at times the lightness may be active rather than still you may feel as if you were being pushed or pulled swayed and rocked or as if you are in, you are traveling on rough water you may feel off balance but it is nonetheless very pleasant the five types of rapture there are five types of rapture the first is called lesser rapture at the beginning of practice after the hindrances have been kept at bay for sufficient periods of time yogis may begin feeling chills and thrills of pleasure sometimes goosebumps this is the beginning of rapturous feelings the next type is called momentary rapture it comes in flashes like lightning and is more intense than the first type the third kind is overwhelming rapture the classical simile is of someone sitting by the sea and suddenly seeing a huge wave that is coming to engulf them yogis experience a similar feeling of being swept off the ground their hearts thump and are overwhelmed they wonder what is happening the fourth type of rapture is uplifting and exhilarating rapture with this you feel so light that you might think you are sitting a few feet off the ground you feel as if you are floating about or flying rather than walking on the earth the fifth type of rapture pervasive rapture is the strongest of all it fills the body if you are sitting you feel fantastically comfortable and you have no desire at all to get up instead there is a great interest in continuing to sit without moving the first three types of rapture are called pamojja or weak rapture the last two deserve the rightful name of pt strong rapture the first three are causes of or stepping stones toward the stronger two 
wise attention causes rapture. As with effort, the Buddha said there is only one cause for rapture, that is wise attention. Specifically, this is wise attention to being effortful in bringing about wholesome rapturous feelings connected with the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. 11 more ways to develop rapture. The commentaries give 11 more ways of arousing rapture. 1. Remembering the virtues of the Buddha. The first way is Buddha Nusati or recollecting the virtues of the Buddha. He has quite a number of virtues and it, and it might not be necessary for you to go through all of the traditional list of them before the first hints of rapture begin to appear. For example, the first traditionally listed virtue is the quality of Araha means that the Buddha is worthy of respect by all humans, devas and brahmas. Due to the purity he attained by becoming, by uprooting all kilesas. Think about the purity he achieved in this way and perhaps some joy will come up in you. You might also recollect the Buddha's three accomplishments as described in our discussion of courageous effort. However, reflections and recitations of formulas are not the only way to recollect the Buddha's virtues. In fact, these are far less reliable than one's own intuitive insights. When a yogi attains the insight into arising and passing away, rapture arises naturally, and so does an appreciation of the Buddha's virtues. The Buddha himself said, One who sees the Dhamma sees me. A yogi who attains insight will truly be able to appreciate the greatness of the founder of our lineage. You might say to yourself, if I am able to experience such purity of mind, how much greater the Buddha's purity must have been. 2. Rejoicing in the Dhamma The second way of arousing rapture is to recollect the Dhamma and its virtues. The first traditional virtue is expressed in a phrase, Well spoken is the Dhamma by the Buddha. Indeed, well proclaimed is the Dhamma by the Buddha. The Buddha taught the Dhamma in the most effective way and your present teachers have reliably transmitted it. This is indeed a cause for rejoicing. The Buddha spoke at length about the threefold training of Sila, Samadhi and Panya. To follow the training, we first maintain purity of conduct by keeping the precepts. We try to develop a high level of moral integrity through taming our actions and speech. This will bring us many benefits. First, we will be free from self-judgment, self-blame and remorse. We are free from censure by the wise and from punishment by the law. Next, if we follow the Buddha's instructions, we will develop concentration. If you are faithful, consistent and patient, 
you can experience a mind that is happy and clear, bright and peaceful. This is Samatha Sukha, the happiness that comes from concentration and tranquility of mind. You can even attain the various levels of jhanas or absorptions, states of consciousness in which the kilesas are temporarily suppressed and an extraordinary peace results. Then, practicing vipassana, we have the chance to experience a third kind of happiness. As you penetrate deeper into the Dhamma, attaining the stage of insight into the rise and fall of phenomena, you will feel exhilarating rapture. This happiness could be called thrilling happiness. Later on comes the happiness of clarity. And eventually, when you reach the inside call, Sankara Upekha Jnana, or the insight into equanimity regarding all formations, you will experience the happiness of equanimity. It is a profound delight, not so agitated and thrilling, but very subtle and balanced. Thus, True to the promises and guarantees of the Buddha, those who follow the path of practice will be able to experience all these sorts of happiness. If you manage to experience all these kinds of happiness yourself, you can deeply appreciate the truth of the Buddha's words. You too will say, Well spoken is the Dhamma by the Buddha. Indeed, well proclaimed is the Dhamma by the Buddha. Finally, transcending all these kinds of happiness is the ultimate happiness of cessation. Going beyond the happiness of equanimity, a yogi can experience a moment of insight into Nibbana, which comes about with the attainment of noble path consciousness. After this, a yogi feels a depth of appreciation for the Buddha's Dhamma that he or she may never have known before. Did the Buddha not say, if you meditate in this way, you can arrive at the cessation of suffering? This is true. Many people have experienced it. And when finally you know for yourself, your mind will sing with rapture and gratitude. Great possibilities that come to fruition in practice. Thus, there are three ways of appreciating the fact that the Dhamma is well proclaimed. First, if you think deeply about the great possibilities that lie within meditation practice, your mind will be full of praise for the Dhamma and of rapture too. Perhaps you naturally possess great faith so that whenever you hear a discourse or read about the Dhamma, you are filled with rapture and interest. This is the first of three ways of, pre of appreciating the Dhamma. Second, if you enter the practice itself, the promises and guarantees of the Buddha will certainly become true. Sila and Samadhi will improve your life. This teaches you more intimately how well proclaimed the Dhamma is for it has brought you clarity of mind and a deep, subtle happiness. Third and finally, the greatness of the Dhamma 
can be seen in the practice of wisdom, which leads eventually to the happiness of Nibbana. At this point, profound changes may take place in your life. It is like being reborn. You can imagine the rapture and appreciation you would feel at this point. 3. Rejoicing in the virtues of the Sangha Recollecting the virtues of the Sangha is the third major way of developing rapture, listed in the commentaries. The Sangha is a group of noble individuals who are totally committed to the path of Dhamma, striving earnestly and patiently. They follow the path in a straight and correct way and arrive at their respective destinations. If you have experienced some purity of mind in your practice, you can imagine other, others feeling the same thing and perhaps even deeper levels, far beyond what you have known. If you have attained some degree of enlightenment, you will be endowed with unshakable faith in the existence of other noble ones who have transversed, who have traversed the same path with you. Such people are indeed pure and impeccable. 4. Considering your own virtue The fourth way of arousing rapture is to consider the purity of your own conduct. Impeccability of conduct is a powerful virtue which brings a great sense of satisfaction and joy to its possessor. It takes great perseverance to maintain purity. When you review your own efforts in this regard, you may feel a deep sense of fulfillment and exhilaration. If you cannot maintain pure conduct, you will be invaded by remorse and self-judgment. You will not be able to concentrate on what you are doing and thus your practice cannot progress. Virtue is the foundation of concentration and wisdom. There are many examples of people who have attained enlightenment by turning their mindfulness towards the rapture that arises from their contemplation of purity of their own sila. This contemplation can be particularly helpful in an emergency, like this story below. Rapture during an emergency, the story of Thissa. There was a young man called Thissa who, upon listening to the Buddha, was struck with a great sense of urgency he was a very ambitious person, but he felt a deep sense of emptiness in the world and so he turned his ambition towards becoming an Arahant. Soon he renounced the worldly life and took the robes of a monk. Before he ordained, he gave some of his property to his younger brother, Kutisa, a, a gift which made his younger brother very prosperous. Unfortunately, his wife suddenly became very greedy. She was afraid that the bhikkhu might change his mind, disrobe and come to reclaim his property, which would deplete her own situation. Kutissa's wife tried to think of ways to protect her newly acquired wealth and finally fell upon the idea of calling some murderers she promised them a handsome price if they would kill the bhikkhu. The murderers agreed and went in search of this bhikkhu in the forest. Finding him immersed in his practice, 
they surrounded him and prepared to kill him. The bhikkhu said, Please wait a while. I haven't finished my job yet. How can we wait? One thug replied, We've got a job to do as well. Just a night or two, the bhikkhu pleaded. Then you can come back and kill me. We don't buy that. You'll run away. Give us a guarantee that you won't, said the thug. The bhikkhu had no material possessions beyond his bowl and rope, so he could not leave any deposit with these people that came to kill him. Instead, he took a huge boulder and smashed both his thigh bones. Satisfied that he could not escape, those killers retreated and left him to his striving. You can imagine what a strong desire the young man had to uproot the killers. He was not afraid to die or suffer pain, but he was afraid of the killers, which were still very much alive in him. He had his life but he has not finished his work yet. And he dreaded the thought of dying before he had uprooted the defilements. Since this young man had renounced the world with such deep faith, he must have been quite diligent in developing his mindfulness. His practice must have been strong enough to face the excruciating pain of two smashed thigh bones for he watched that intense pain without giving in. While he watched, he reflected on his own virtue. He asked himself whether he had broken any of the bhikkhu precepts since the day of ordination. To his delight, he found that he had been perfectly pure without committing a single offence. This realization filled him with satisfaction and rapture. The pain of his fractured limbs subsided, and the intense rapture became the most prominent object in the young man's mind. He turned his mindfulness towards it and noted rapture, happiness, and joy. As he was noting in this way, his insight matured and speeded up. Suddenly, he broke through. He experienced the Four Noble Truths and became an Arahant in a short space of time. The moral of this story is that one should build a good foundation in Sila. Without Sila, Sitting meditation is no more than an invitation to aches and pains. Build up your foundation. If your sealer is powerful, your meditative efforts will prove very fruitful. Five. Remembering your own generosity. The fifth way of arousing rapture is to recollect one's own generosity. If one can perform an act of charity without any selfish motivation at all, but rather wishing for the welfare and happiness of others, or wishing for liberation from suffering, then that act will be full of merit. Not only that, that act brings great happiness and gladness into your mind. Motivation is crucial in determining whether generosity is beneficial. It should not be motivated by ulterior selfishness. Generosity is not only financial, it can also mean simply encouraging a friend who is in need of support. It is most important to be generous in times of scarcity 
and these can also be the most satisfying time to share the little that one has. There is a story of a king in Sri Lanka in the old days. Seems that one day he was retreating hastily from a battle, carrying only the barest of provisions. While he was going through the forest, he chanced upon a bhikkhu making arms rounds. The bhikkhu was an arahant, it seems. The king gave part of his food to that monk, even though he had only had just enough for himself, his horse and his attendant. Much later, when he recalled all the gifts he had given in his life, some of which had been splendid and precious, this merit was the one he cherished the most. Another story on this subject is set in the Mahasi Sasana Yathika, a center in Rangon. Some years ago, when the center still was in a slow process of development, some of the yogis could not afford to pay for their food and accommodations. People were poor at that time, but these yogis were making good progress, and it was a great pity to see them leaving the center only because they could not afford to stay. So the meditation teachers got together and supported those yogis who had strong potential. Indeed, these students made tremendous progress. When the yogis succeeded in attaining their goals, the teachers were filled with joy and rapture. 6. Considering the Virtues of the Gods The sixth way to bring rapture is to think of the virtues of the Devas and Brahmas, beings in the higher realms. While these beings were still in the human realm, they had great faith in Kamma. They believed that good actions will bring a reward and harm will bring harmful consequences. So they tried to practice what was good and refrain from unskillful actions. Some of them even meditated. The positive force of these beings and their actions resulted in their rebirth in higher planes, where life is more pleasant than it is in our human world. Those who gained absorption in the jhanas were reborn in the Brahma world with lifespans lasting many eons. Thus, when we think of the virtues of superhuman beings, we actually consider the faith, charity, effort and perseverance which they developed in the human world. It is easy to compare them with ourselves. If we can find ourselves on par with the Devas and Brahmas, we can be filled with so much satisfaction and so much joy. 7. Reflecting on Perfect Peace The seventh way of arousing rapture is to reflect on the peace of cessation of kilesas. In the ultimate sense, this means reflecting on Nibbana. If you have experienced this depth of peace, you can bring up a lot of rapture upon recollecting it. If you have not yet experienced Nibbana yourself, you can reflect on the coolness of deep concentration or jhanas. The peace of Deep concentration is far superior to worldly pleasures. There are people whose skill at absorption is so strong that even when they are not actually practicing concentration, their minds are never invaded by the kilesas. 
Thus, for sixty or seventy years, they may live in peace. If you have not experienced a jhana, then you can remember times in your practice where the mind felt pure and clean, when the kilesas are put aside for some time. Tranquility and coolness naturally fill the mind. You may find yourself comparing this with the happiness you may have enjoyed in this world. You will see that worldly happiness is quite coarse and gross in comparison with the happiness of such a practice. Unlike the rapture of coolness that arises from purity of mind, there is something burning about worldly pleasures. Comparing thus, you may be filled with rapture. 8 and 9. Avoiding coarse people, seeking refined friends. The 8th and ninth ways of arousing rapture are related. They are to avoid rough and coarse persons, persons overwhelmed by anger and lacking in metta or loving kindness, and to seek out refined people who have metta in their hearts. In this world, there are many people who are so overwhelmed by anger that they cannot appreciate the difference between wholesome and unwholesome activities. They do not know the benefit or the appropriateness of paying respects to the persons worthy of respect, nor of learning about the Dhamma, nor of actually meditating. They may be hot-tempered, easily victimized by anger and aversion. Their lives may be filled with rough and distasteful activities. Living with such a person, you can imagine, might not be very rapturous experience. Other people have a deep considerateness and loving care for other beings. The warmth and love of their hearts is manifested in actions and speech. Refined individuals like these carry out their relationship in a subtle, sweet way. Gaining company is very fulfilling. One is surrounded by an aura of love and warmth, which leads to the arising of rapture. 10. Reflecting on the Suttas The tenth way of arousing rapture is reflecting on the Suttas. Some Suttas describe the virtues of the Buddha, if you are a person with a lot of faith, reflecting on those suttas can give you a great joy and great happiness. The Satipatthana Sutta, among others, talks about the benefits one can enjoy through practicing the Dhamma. Others contain inspiring stories of the Sangha, the community of the noble ones. Reading or reflecting on these suttas can fill one with inspiration, which leads to rapture and happiness. 11. Inclining the mind Finally, if you firmly and consistently incline the mind towards developing rapture, your aim will be fulfilled. You must understand that rapture arises when the mind is relatively clean of kilesas. So to reach rapture, you must put in energy to be mindful from moment to moment so that concentration arises and the kilesas are kept at bay. You must be fully committed 
to the task of arousing firm mindfulness in each moment, whether you are sitting or lying down, even walking or standing or doing other activities. Tranquility, fifth factor of enlightenment. Most people's minds are in a stage of agitation all the time. Their minds run here and there, flapping like flags in a strong wind, scattering like a pile of ashes into which a stone is tossed. There is no coolness or calmness, no silence, no peace. This restlessness or dissipation of mind might properly be called the waves of mind, reminiscent of the water's surface when wind is blowing. Ripples or waves of mind become apparent when restlessness occurs. Even if this scattered mind becomes concentrated, the concentration still is associated with restlessness, as when one sick member of the family affects all the others with feverishness and unrest. So too, restlessness has a strong effect on other simultaneously occurring mental states. When restlessness is present, it is not possible for true happiness to be reached. When the mind is scattered, it is difficult to control our behavior. We begin to act according to our whims and fancies without considering properly whether an action is wholesome or not. Because of this unthinking mind, we may find ourselves performing unskillful actions or saying unskillful things. Such speech and action can lead to remorse, self-judgment, and even more agitation. I was wrong. I shouldn't have said that. If only I would thought about it before I did it. When the mind is assaulted by remorse and regret, it will not be able to gain happiness. The enlightenment factor of tranquility arises in the absence of restlessness and remorse. The Pali word for it is Pasadi, which means cool calmness. Coolness and calmness of mind can only occur when mental agitation or activity have been silenced. In the world today, people feel a lot of mental suffering. Many resort to drugs, tranquilizers, and sleeping pills to bring calm and enjoyment to their minds. Often young people experiment with drugs to get through a period in their lives when they feel great agitation. Unfortunately, they sometimes find drugs so enjoyable that they end up addicted, which is a terrible pity. The tranquil peace that comes from meditation is far superior to anything drugs or other external substances can provide. Of course, the goal of meditation is much higher than just peace. But peace and tranquility are nonetheless benefits of walking the straight, correct path of the Dhamma. Calming the body and mind. 
The characteristic of Pasadi is to calm the mind and body, to silence and tranquilize agitation. Extracting heat from the mind. Its function is to extract or suppress the heat of the mind which arises due to restlessness, dissipation, or remorse. When the mind is assaulted by these harmful states, it becomes hot, as if on fire. Tranquility of mind extinguishes that heat and replaces it with the characteristic of coolness and ease. Non-agitation The manifestation of Pasadi is non-agitation of body and mind. As a yogi, you can easily observe how this state of mind brings about great calm and tranquility, physical and mental. Surely, you are familiar with the absence of tranquility. There is always an urge to move, to get up, and do something. The body twitches, the mind darts nervously back and forth. When all of these ceases, there is no ripples in the mind, just a smooth and calm state. Moments become gentle, smooth and graceful. You can sit with hardly a flutter of moment. This factor of enlightenment follows invariably upon the arising of the precious one, rapture. The strongest rapture, pervasive rapture, is most particularly associated with strong tranquility. After pervasive rapture has filled the whole body, one feels unwilling to move at all, not to mention to disturb one's mental stillness. It is said that the Buddha spent the first 49 days after his liberation enjoying the fruits of enlightenment. He maintained certain postures for seven days each at seven different places, enjoying the fruits of enlightenment by going in and out of fruition attainments. By virtue of his pervasive Dhamma, Piti, or Dhamma rapture, his whole body was permeated with satisfaction for all of that time, so that he did not want to move and could not even fully close his eyelids. His eyes remained fully opened or half open. You too may experience how the eyes fly open involuntarily when strong rupture arises. You may try to close them, but they fly open again. Eventually, you may decide to continue your practice with your eyes open. If you have such experiences, perhaps you can appreciate how much greater was the Buddha's happiness and Dhamma rapture? Wise attention brings tranquility. According to Buddha, the way to arouse tranquility is through wise attention. More specifically, this is wise attention directed toward activating wholesome thoughts wholesome mental states, and more importantly, meditative mental states, so that tranquility and rupture will arise. Seven more ways of developing tranquility. For their part, 
the commentators point out seven ways to arouse in tranquility. 1. Proper food. The first way is to take sensible and nutritious food, food that satisfies the twin principles of necessity and suitability. Nutrition is very important, as you know. One's diet need to be elaborate, but it should provide for the body's physical needs. If your food is not nutritious enough, your physical strength will not be sufficient for you to make progress in meditation. Food should also be suitable, which means appropriate for you personally. If certain foods cause digestive upheavals or if you really dislike them, you will not be able to practice. You will not feel well and you will constantly be pinning for foods you would prefer to have. We might draw a good lesson from the Buddha's time. A particular rich merchant and a lay woman were the leaders and organizers of most of the religious occasions in the area where the Buddha was teaching. Somehow, things never seemed to work quite right unless these two were involved in planning and organizing a retreat or other event. Their secret of success was holding to the principles of necessity and suitability. They always took the trouble to find out what was needed by the monks, nuns or yogis who were invited to receive food donations. The man and woman also found out what was suitable. Perhaps you can remember having food you needed and longed for, food which also suitable, so that after eating it, you found your mind become calm and concentrated. 2. Good Climate The second way to arouse tranquility is to meditate in an environment where the weather is good, so that you find it comfortable and convenient to meditate. Everyone has preferences. No matter what we prefer, however, it is possible to adapt to different climates by the use of fans and heaters or lighter and heavier clothing. Number three, a comfortable posture. A third way to cultivate tranquility is to adopt a comfortable posture. We generally sit and walk in vipassana practice. These are the two best postures for beginners. Comfortable does not mean luxurious. Lying down or sitting in a chair with a backrest might be considered luxurious postures unless you have a physical ailment that makes them necessary. When you sit unsupported or when you walk, you need a certain degree of physical effort to keep from falling over. In a luxurious postures, this effort is missing and it is easier to doze off. The mind becomes very relaxed and comfortable and in no time, you might disturb the air with snores. Number four, neither over-enthusiasm nor sloppiness. The fourth way to arouse tranquility is to maintain a balanced effort in practice. You should be neither over-enthusiastic nor sloppy. If you push yourself too hard, you will miss the object and become tired. If you are lazy, 
you will not move very far ahead. Overzealous people may be likened to people who are in a big hurry to reach the top of the mountain. They climb very quickly, but because the mountain is steep, they must stop frequently to rest. In the end, it takes them a long time to get to the top of the mountain. Lazy, sloppy types, on the other hand, will be like snails crawling far behind. 5 and 6 Avoiding rough people, choosing calm and kind friends. Avoiding bad-tempered, rough or cruel people can also aid tranquility. It is obvious that if your companions are hot-tempered, always angry with you and scolding you, you will never arrive at peace of mind. It is also evident that you will become more tranquil by associating with people who are calm and quiet in body and in mind. Number seven, inclining the mind toward peacefulness. Last, if you constantly incline your mind toward practice, hoping to achieve tranquility and peace, you can realize this aim. If you are vigilant in activating mindfulness, the enlightenment factor of tranquility will arise in you quite naturally. Concentration, sixth factor of enlightenment. Concentration is that factor of mind which lands on the object of observation, which pricks into it, penetrates into it, and stays there. The Pali word for it is Samadhi. Non-agitation. The characteristic of Samadhi is non-dispersal, non-dissipation, non-scatteredness. This means that the mind sticks with the object of observation, sinks into it, and remains still and calm right there. Fixed concentration and moving concentration. There are two types of samadhi. One is continuous samadhi, which is the concentration gained while meditating on a sing single object. This is the type of concentration gained in pure tranquility meditation, where the one requirement is for the mind to stay put on one object to the total exclusion of all other objects. Those who follow the path of continuous concentration are able to experience it specially when they gain absorption into the jhanas. Vipassana practice, however, is aimed toward the development of wisdom and the completion of the various stages of insight. Insight, of course, refers to basic intuitive understandings such as the distinction between mind and matter, the intuitive comprehension of their interrelationship by virtue of cause and effect, and the direct perception of the impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and selflessness of all physical and mental phenomena. These are basic insights, and there are others which one must traverse before attaining the path and fruition consciousness, which have Nibbana, or the cessation of all suffering as their object. In Vipassana practice, the field of awareness of objects 
is crucially important. The field of vipassana objects are mental and physical phenomena, those things which are directly perceptible without resorting to the thinking process. In other words, as we practice vipassana, we observe many different objects with the goal of gaining insight into their nature. Momentary concentration, the second type, is most important in vipassana practice. Vipassana objects are arising and passing away all the time, and momentary concentration arises in each moment with each object. In spite of its momentary nature, such samadhi can arise from moment to moment without breaks in between. If it does so, momentary concentration shares with continuous concentration the power to tranquilize the mind and keep the kilesas at bay. Gathering the mind. Let us say you are sitting, watching the rising and falling of the abdomen. As you make the effort to be mindful of the rising and falling processes, you are being with the moment. With each moment of energy and effort you expect in cultivating awareness, there is a corresponding mental activity of penetration. It is as though the mind were stuck fast into the object of observation. You drop or fall into the object. Not only is the mind one-pointed and penetrating into the object, not only does the mind remain still for that moment in that object, but this mental factor of samadhi has the power to gather together the other mental factors which arise simultaneously with that moment of consciousness. Concentration is a factor which collects the mind together. That is its function. It keeps all the mental factors in a group so that they do not scatter or disperse. Thus, the mind remains firmly embedded in the object. Peace and stillness. There is an analogy here with parents and children. Good parents want their children to grow up to be well-mannered and morally responsible adults. Toward this goal, they exercise some degree of control over their offspring. Kids are not yet mature and they lack the wisdom of discretion. So parents must make sure they do not run out and mix with the naughty children and the neighborhood. Mental factors are like children in their respect. Just as children who lack parental guidance may act in ways that harm themselves and others, so too the uncontrolled mind will suffer from bad influences. The kilesas are always loitering nearby. If the mind is not contained, it can easily mix with delinquents like desire, aversion, anger or delusion. Then the mind becomes wild and ill-mannered, which manifests in bodily behavior as well as in speech. 
the mind like a child may resent discipline at first. By and by, however, it will become more and more tame and civilized and tranquil and more remote from attacks by the kilesas. The concentrated mind becomes more and more still, more and more quiet, more and more peaceful. This sense of peace and stillness is the manifestation of concentration. Children too can be tamed if they are properly cared for. They may have a wild nature at first, but eventually, as they mature, they will understand why they should avoid bad people. They will even begin to be grateful for the care and control their parents gave to them. Perhaps they even observe that some childhood friend whose parents lacked vigilance has grown up to be a criminal. When they are old enough to go out into the world, they will be able to discriminate for themselves what sort of people to choose as friends and whom to stay away from. As they grow older and more mature, this upbringing of theirs causes their continued development and prosperity. Concentration permits wisdom to arise. Concentration is a proximate cause for the unfolding of wisdom. This fact is very important. Once the mind is quiet and still, there is space for wisdom to arise. There can be comprehension of the true nature of mind and matter. Perhaps there will be an intuitive insight into how mind and matter can be differentiated and how they are related by cause and effect. Step by step, wisdom will penetrate into more and more profound levels of truth. One will see clearly the characteristics of impermanence, suffering, and absence of self. And finally, insight is gained into the cessation of suffering. When this illumination happens, a person will never be able to become a grossly evil person again no matter what environment he or she may be in. Parents and Children Parents or potential parents should perhaps prick up their ears here. It is very important for parents to control their own minds by concentration. Eventually, they should complete the various levels of insight. Such parents can be very skillful in bringing up children because they can differentiate clearly between wholesome and unwholesome activities. They will be able to instruct their children likewise, most particularly by setting a good example. Parents who do not control their minds who are given to ill-mannered behavior, cannot help their children develop goodness and intelligence. Some of my students in Burma have been parents. When they started meditation, they only considered their children's worldly welfare with respect to education and earning a livelihood in this world. Then these parents came to our meditation center and practiced. They had deep practice. When they returned to their children, they had new attitudes and plans. They now felt that it was more important for their children to learn to control their minds 
and develop good hearts than, than just to gain success in the world. When the children came of age, their parents urged them to practice meditation. In fact, when I asked the parents if there was a difference between children born before and after meditation practices, the parents replied, Oh, certainly. Those who were born after we completed our meditation practice were more obedient and considerate. They have good hearts compared with the other children. Steady attention causes concentration. The Buddha said that continuous wise attention aimed towards the development of concentration was the cause of concentration. Preceding concentration causes successive concentration to arise. 11 more ways to arouse concentration. The commentaries describe 11 more ways to arouse concentration. 1. Cleanliness. The first is purity of the internal and external basis of the body and the environment. This influence has been discussed under the second factor of enlightenment investigation. See page 103. Number two, a balanced mind. The second cause of concentration is balancing the controlling faculties, wisdom and faith on, on the one hand, energy and concentration on the other. I have devoted a chapter to this balancing. See page 29. Number three, clear mental image. The third cause is more relevant to jhana practice than to strict vipassana. And so I will mention it only briefly. It is to be skillful in the concentration object, meaning to maintain a clearer mental image as it practiced in tranquility meditation. Number four, uplifting the discouraged mind. The fourth cause is to uplift the mind when it becomes heavy, depressed or discouraged. You have undoubtedly taken a lot of bumps and tumbles in your practice. At these times, you should try to uplift your mind, perhaps applying techniques for arousing energy, rupture or insight. Uplifting the discouraged mind is also one of the teacher's jobs. When a yogi comes to interviews with a long and sullen face, the teacher knows how to inspire him or her. Number five, calming the over enthusiastic mind. At times, it is also necessary to put down the excited mind. This is the fifth cause leading to the development of concentration. At times, yogis have fascinating experiences in their meditation practice. They become excited and active. Their energy overflows. At these times, the teacher should not be encouraging. He or she should speak in such a way as to put yogis in their proper place, one might say. A teacher might also help to activate the fifth factor of enlightenment tranquility by the means discussed in the previous section or the teacher may instruct yogis to take it easy just settle back and watch without trying too hard number six cheering the mind that is withered by pain 
If the mind is shrunken and withered by pain, it may need to be made happy. This is the sixth means. A yogi may feel depressed by the environment or by a recurrence of an old health problem. At this time, the mind needs to be uplifted and cleared so that it becomes bright and sharp again. You might try to liven it up in various ways, or the teacher also can cheer you up, not by telling jokes, but by encouraging talk. Number seven. Continuous Balanced Awareness The seventh way to arouse Samadhi is to continue balanced awareness at all times. Sometimes, as the practice really deepens, you seem to be making no effort, but you are still mindful of objects as they arise and pass. At such times, you should try not to interfere. If this is comfortable speed, feels too slow for you and you want to step on the gas, you may want to realize the Dhamma very quickly. If you do try to speed up, you will upset the mind's equilibrium and your awareness will become blunt. On the other hand, everything is so nice and smooth that you might relax too much. This too brings regression in practice. When there is effortless effort, you should cruise along. Yet, nonetheless, keep up with the momentum that is present. Number 8 and 9. Avoiding the distracted, choosing friends who are focused. You should avoid people who are unconcentrated and keep company with people who are concentrated. The 8th and ninth arousers of concentration. People who are neither calm nor peaceful, who have never developed any kind of concentration, carry a lot of agitation within them. Children born to such parents may also lack peace of mind. In Burma, there is a concept closely related to the current Western notion of good vibes. There are many cases of people who have never meditated before. But when they come into the meditation center as visitors, they begin to feel very tranquilized and peaceful. They get the vibrations of yogis who are working seriously. Some visitors decide to come and practice. This seems very natural. In the Buddha's time, there was a king named Ajata Sattu, who had killed his father to gain the throne. He spent many, many sleepless nights after committing his evil deed. Finally, he decided to consult the Buddha. He went through the forest and came up upon a group of monks listening with peaceful concentration to a discourse of the Buddha. It is said that all his remorse and agitation disappeared and he was filled with calm and tranquility such as he had not felt in a long time. Number 10. Reflecting on the Peace of Absorption the tenth method is to reflect on the peace and tranquility of the jhanic absorptions. This is relevant for yogis who have meditated in this way 
and attain pure tranquility. Remembering the method they use to attain jhana, they can briefly use it in the present moment to attain concentration of mind. Those who have not yet attained the jhanas perhaps can recall some of the times when momentary concentration was very strong, when there was a feeling of peace and one-pointedness. By remembering the feeling of liberation from hindrances and the peace of mind that comes from continually activating momentary concentration, concentration could gain a rise. Number 11. Inclining the mind. The eleventh and last cause for concentration is to incline the mind persistently toward developing concentration. Everything depends on the effort expanded in each moment. If you try to be concentrated, you will succeed. Equanimity, the seventh factor of enlightenment. Perhaps the United Nations should be given a new name. If it were called the Organization of Equanimities, delegates might be reminded of the state of mind that is essential at the negotiation table, especially when facing a hot problem. Any decision maker must be able to remain unbiased in the face of difficult problems. The Pali word upekka, usually translated as equanimity, actually refers to the balance of energy. It is that state of mind which is in the center, inclining neither to one extreme nor the other. It can be cultivated in ordinary life with its daily processes of decision as well as in meditation. Meditating the internal contest. In meditation, various states of mind compete. Faith tries to overwhelm its complement intelligence or vice versa. It is the same with effort and concentration. It is common knowledge among meditators that a balance in these two pairs of mental states is essential to maintain progress and direction in practice. At the beginning of a retreat, you may be able to be very enthusiastic and ambitious Immediately upon sitting down, you, you pounce on the rising and falling of any other object that arises in your field of awareness. Due to the excess effort, your mind is likely to overshoot the object of meditation or slip off it. This missing of the mark may upset you for you will feel that you are doing your best and yet not succeeding. Perhaps you discover your folly and are able to slip into the rhythm of what is happening. As you watch the rising and falling, the mind fits into these processes and goes along with them. In time, it becomes easy and you begin to relax a bit. Effort seems pointless, but if you are not careful, sloth and torpor will creep in and overwhelm you. At times a yogi may be quite successful in distinguishing mind and matter and seeing their connection. They get a flavor of the Dhamma and find 
this quite exciting. Filled with faith, the yogi begins to want to tell friends and parents about the wonderful truths they had just discovered. Due to faith, imagination and planning running wild. With so much thinking and feeling going on, the practice grinds to a halt. This succession of events is symptomatic with excessive faith. Another yogi might have the same intuitive insight, but instead of wanting to spread the Dhamma, they begin to interpret the experience. You might say this type of yogi makes a mountain out of a molehill. Every little thing he or she perceives is interpreted in the light of meditation literature which yogi which this yogi has read. A string of reflections and thoughts arise again blocking the practice. Such are the symptoms of excess of intelligence. Many yogis have a great tendency to reason and check out what they hear before they accept it. They take pride in their quality of discrimination. When they come to meditate, they are always testing in an intellectual way the validity of what they are doing, verifying the practice against their intellectual understanding. If they remain caught in this pattern, such yogis will always be plagued by doubt, rotating endlessly on doubt's merry-go-round. They will never move forward. Faith balanced with intelligence, energy balanced with concentration. The characteristic of equanimity is the balancing of corresponding mental states so that one does not overwhelm the other. It creates a balance between faith and intelligence, also energy and concentration, neither in excess nor in lack. The function of equanimity as a factor of enlightenment is to fill in where there is lack and to reduce where there is excess. Equanimity arrests the mind before it falls into extremes of excess or lack. When upekka is strong, there is total balance. No inclination at all toward excess in any direction. The yogi does not need to make an effort to be mindful. A good driver just lets the horses pull. It seems as if mindfulness is taking care of everything, like the driver of the carriage who settles back and lets the horse do the work pulling. This state of ease and balance is the manifestation of equanimity. When I was a child, I heard people talking about how to carry two baskets on the ends of a bamboo pole. This is common in Burma. The pole is carried over one shoulder with a loaded basket on the front end and another in back. When you first start off, you have to exert a lot of effort and the load feels burdensome. But after 10 or 15 steps, the pole begins to rock up and down to the rhythm of your walking. You and the pole and the baskets move along in a relaxed way so that you hardly feel the load. I could not believe this at first, but now that I've meditated, I know that is quite possible. Continuous mindfulness causes equanimity. According to the Buddha, the way, of, the way to bring about equanimity is 
wise attention to be continually mindful from moment to moment without a break based on the intention to develop equanimity. One moment of equanimity causes a succeeding moment of equanimity to arise. Once equanimity is activated, it will be the cause for equanimity to continue and to deepen. It can bring one to deep levels of practice beyond the insight into the arising and passing away of phenomena. Equanimity does not arise easily in the minds of beginning yogis. Though these yogis may be diligent in trying to be mindful from moment to moment, equanimity comes and grows, goes. The mind will be well balanced for a little while and then it will go off again. Step by step, equanimity is strengthened. The intervals when it is present grow more prolonged and frequent. Eventually, equanimity becomes strong enough to qualify as a factor of enlightenment. Five more ways to develop equanimity. There are five ways to arouse equanimity discussed in the commentaries. One, balanced emotion toward all living things. The first and foremost is to have equanimous attitude toward all living beings. These are your loved ones, including animals. We can have a lot of attachment and desire associated with the people we love and also with our pets. Sometimes we can be what we call crazy about someone. This experience does not contribute to equanimity, which we call a state of balance. To prepare the ground for equanimity to arise, one should try to cultivate an attitude of non-attachment and equanimity toward the people and animals we love. As worldly people, it may be necessary to have a certain amount of attachment in relationships, but excessive attachment is destructive to us as well as our loved ones. We begin to worry too much over their welfare, especially in a retreat. We should try to put aside such excessive concern and worry for the welfare of our friends. One reflection that can develop non-attachment is to regard all beings as the heirs of their own karma. People reap the rewards of good karma and suffer the consequences of unwholesome acts. They created this karma under their own volition and no one can prevent their experience of having its consequences. On the ultimate level, there is nothing you or anybody else can do to save them. If you think in this way, you may worry less about your loved ones. You can Gain equanimity about beings by reflecting on ultimate reality. Perhaps you can tell yourself that, ultimately speaking, there is only mind and matter. Where is that person you are so wildly in love with? There is only Nama and Rupa, mind and body, arising and passing away from moment to moment. Which moment are you in love with? You may be able to drive some sense into your heart this way. One might worry that reflections like this could turn into unfeeling indifference and lead us into abandoning a mate or a dear person. This is not the case. Equanimity is not Insensitivity. 
indifference or apathy. It is simply non-preferential. Under its influence, one does not push aside the things or dislikes that he has, nor grasp at things one prefers. The mind rests in an attitude of balance and acceptance of things as they are. When equanimity, this factor of enlightenment, is present, one abandons both attachment to beings and dislikes for them. The texts tell us that equanimity is the cause for the cleansing and purification of one who has deep tendencies toward lust or desire, which is the opposite of equanimity. 2. Balanced emotion towards inanimate things The second way of developing this factor of enlightenment is to adopt an attitude of balance towards inanimate things. This can be property, clothing, the latest fad on the market. Clothing, for example, will be ripped and stained someday. It will decay and perish because it is impermanent. Like everything else. Furthermore, we do not even own it, not in the ultimate sense. Everything is non-self. There is no one to own anything. To develop balance and to cut down attachment, it is helpful to look at material things as transient. You might say to yourself, I'm going to make use of this for a short time. It's not going to last forever. People who get caught up in fads may be compelled to buy each new product that appears on the market. Once this gadget has been bought, another more sophisticated model will soon appear. Such persons throw away the old one and buy a new one. This behavior does not reflect equanimity. 3. Avoiding people who go crazy The third method of developing equanimity as an enlightenment factor is avoiding the company of people who tend to be crazy about people and things. These people have a deep possessiveness, clinging to what they think belongs to them both people and to things. Some people find it difficult to see another person enjoying or using their property. There is a case of an elder who had a great attachment to pets. It seems that in his monastery he bred a lot of dogs and cats. One day this elder came to the center in Rangon to do a retreat. When he was meditating, he was practicing under the favorable circumstances. But his practice was not very deep. Finally, I had an idea and asked him if he had any pets in his monastery. He brightened up and said, Oh yes, I have so many dogs and cats. Ever since I came here, I've been thinking about whether they have enough food to eat and how they are doing. I asked him to forget about the animals and concentrate on meditation. And quite soon he was making good progress. Please do not allow over-attachment to loved ones or even pets. To prevent you from attending meditation retreats which will allow you to deepen your practice and to develop equanimity as a factor of enlightenment. 4. Choosing friends who stay cool 
As a fourth method of arousing Opekka, you should choose friends who have no great attachment to beings or possessions. This method of developing equanimity is simply the converse of the preceding one. In choosing such a friend, if you happen to pick an elder I described just now, it could be a bit of a problem. 5. Inclining the mind towards balance The fifth and last cause for this factor of enlightenment to arise is constant, constantly to incline your mind towards the cultivation of equanimity. When your mind is inclined in this way, it will not wander off to thoughts of your dogs and cats at home or of your loved ones. It will only become more balanced and harmonious. Equanimity is of tremendous importance both in the practice and in everyday life. Generally, we get either swept away by pleasant and enticing objects or worked up into a great state of agitation when confronted by unpleasant, undesirable objects. This wild alternation of contraries is nearly universal among human beings. When we lack the ability to stay balanced and unfaltering, we are easily swept into extremes of craving or aversion. The scriptures say that even when the mind indulges in sensual objects, it becomes agitated. This is the usual state of affairs in the world. As we can observe, in their quest for happiness, people mistake excitement of the mind for real happiness. They never have the chance to experience the greater joy that comes with peace and tranquility. The factors of enlightenment developed into the deathless. All of the factors of enlightenment bring extraordinary benefits. Once fully developed, they have the power to bring samsaric suffering to an end. So the scriptures tell us. This means that the perpetual Cyclical birth and death of beings who are composed of mental and physical phenomena can come to a complete stop. The factors of enlightenment also have the capacity to pulverize Mara's ten armies, the, the destructive inner forces which keep us bound on the wheel of suffering and rebirth. For this reason, Buddhas and enlightened ones develop the factors of enlightenment and are thus able to transcend this realm of sensual pleasures as well as the realms of subtle form and all the formless realms. You may ask where one goes after being liberated from these three types of realms. It cannot be said there is another birth of any kind, for with Nibbana comes cessation of birth and death. Birth brings inevitable life, aging, sickness, and eventual death, all the aspects of suffering. To be free from all suffering is to be free from birth, nor will death be able to happen. Nibbana is free from birth and also from death. When fully developed, 
These factors of enlightenment bring the yogi to attain Nibbana. In this, they are comparable to strong, effective medicine. They confer the strength of mind necessary to withstand the ups and downs of life. Moreover, they often cure physical and mental diseases. There is no guarantee that if you meditate, you will be able to cure every disease. However, it is possible that the development of enlightenment factors can bring healing to sickness even those which appear incurable. Purifying our mental illnesses. Mental disease is the disease of greed, hatred, delusion, jealousy, miserliness, conceit, and so forth. When these forces arise, they make the mind unclear and clouded. This clouded mind will produce physical phenomena which reflect its clouded state. Instead of having a clear and bright complexion, when your mind is clouded by negativity, you will look dull, unhappy and unhealthy much as if you had been breathing polluted air. However, if you are energetically trying to activate a penetrative mindfulness from moment to moment on the object of observation, very naturally the mind will stay on this object without scattering or dissipating. Samadhi or concentration is present at this time. After a due period, the mind will be cleansed of all hindrances or negative tendencies. Now wisdom will begin to unfold. When insights arise, the mind becomes even purer as if it were breathing clean air again after returning from the hustle and bustle of a city. Mindfulness, energy and investigation lead to concentration and insights which arise in successive stages. Each new insight is like another breath of fresh air to the mind. The stage of insight into the arising and passing away of phenomena is the beginning of good deep practice. The factor of equanimity begins to stabilize the mind and mindfulness becomes deeper and deeper. The arising and passing away of objects will be perfectly dear and there will be no doubt about the true nature of what can be directly experienced. Sudden upsurges of energy may make the practice seem effortless at this point. Yogis may understand that there is no one present even to make an effort. Joy and rapture arises as the yogi perceives directly his or her own purity of mind, as well as the secret of reality unfolding from moment to moment. Tremendous joy is followed by tranquil peace and a mind that is free from doubts and worries. 
In this peaceful space, it is possible to see more and more clearly. Concentration can also deepen when there is no disturbance. At this deep level of practice, one can truly experience a balanced mind, a mind that is not swept away by pleasant sensations, even though extreme rapture and joy may be present. Nor due to unpleasant objects agitate the mind. Yogis feel no dislike for pain, no attachment to pleasure. Effects on the body The seven factors of enlightenment naturally affect the body as well as the mind, for these two are intricately connected. When the mind is really pure and infused with factors of enlightenment, this has a tremendous effect on the circulatory system. New blood being produced is extremely pure. It permeates the various organs and sense organs, clearing them. The body becomes luminous and perceptions are heightened. Visual objects will be extremely brilliant and clear. Some yogis may perceive so much light emanating from their bodies that their entire rooms may be lit up at night. The mind, too, is filled with light. There is bright faith, as well as the verified faith of believing in your own unmediated experience of what is happening. The mind becomes light and agile, as does the body, which sometimes feel as if it is floating in the air. Often, the body may become quite imperceptible, and yogis can sit for many hours without feeling any pain at all. Miraculous Cures All diseases incurable ailments are affected by the strength of the enlightenment factors, especially at the deeper levels of practice. At the center of Rangoon, it is common occurrence for so-called miraculous cures to occur. Entire books could be written just listing the cases. Here, I will merely mention two outstanding ones. A case of tuberculosis. Once there was a man who had been suffering from tuberculosis for many years, having sought treatment from various doctors and traditional Burmese herbalists and having spent time in the TB ward of Rangoon General Hospital, still he was not cured. Downhearted and desperate, he felt certain that the only path open to him led toward death. As a last resort, he applied to meditate at the center, but concealed his poor state of health lest he be refused admittance on the grounds that other yogis' health would be endangered. Within two weeks of practice, his chronic symptoms came to the surface with a vengeance increased by the painful sensations that normally came during a certain period of practicing the Dhamma. His pain was so excruciating, agonizing 
and exhausting that he could not sleep at all but lay awake all night coughing. One night I was in my cottage and I heard the terrible coughing sound that came from his quarters. Taking some Burmese herbal cough medicine, I went to him expecting to help alleviate some recently contracted flu or cold. Instead, the man was sprawled in his room, so exhausted that he could not say a word to me. His spittoon was nearly filled with blood he had coughed up. I asked if he wanted medicine, and when at least he was able to speak, he confessed his medical condition. My first thought was to wonder whether I had breathed any of his germs. The man went on apologizing for having brought this infectious condition into the retreat center but begged for permission to continue his practice. If I leave, there is only one path for me, and that is the path to death, he said. These words touched my heart. I quickly began to encourage and inspire him to continue the practice. After making quarantine arrangements, to prevent his tuberculosis from spreading all over the center, I continued to instruct him. Within a month, the man had overcome his tuberculosis through his fantastic progression in meditation. He left the center completely cured. Three years later, he reappeared as a robust and healthy monk. I asked him how he felt now. Had his TB or coughing fits recurred? No, said the man. The TB has never returned. As for coughing, at times my throat itches, but if I am mindful of this sensation immediately, I don't begin to cough. The Dhamma is fantastic, miraculous. Having drunk the medicine of Dhamma, I'm completely cured. A woman's high blood pressure. Another case happened about 20 years ago. This was a woman who lived in the centre compound. She was related to one of the staff members. For a long time, she had suffered from high blood pressure and had sought treatment and drugs from doctors. Sometimes she come to me and I would encourage her to meditate, saying that, even if she died in the course of the practice, she would enjoy a lot of happiness in her next rebirth. She always had an excuse, though, and continued to take refuge in her doctors. Finally, I gave her a scolding. Many people come from long distances, even from foreign countries, to taste the Dhamma in this retreat center. Their practice is deep and they experience many fantastic things. You live here and yet you haven't meditated to any level of satisfaction at all. You remind me of a fierce-looking stone lion which guards the foot of the stupa. Those lions, you know, always have their backs to the stupor so that they can never pay it any respect. 
The woman was quite hurt by the scolding and agreed to try meditation. Within a short time, she had reached the stage of great pain. The pain for her illness, combined with the pain of the Dhamma, gave her a really tough time. She could hardly eat or sleep. Eventually, her family members, who also lived at the center, began to become alarmed at her condition. They begged her to return to their quarters so that they could take care of her. I was opposed to this and exhorted her to continue her practice rather than to listen to them. Her family members came to her again and again, and I, for my part, insisted that she continue. It was quite a battle for this woman, but she persisted with her meditation. She was very tough. She had a new surge of inspiration and resolved to see her practice through to the end, even if she died. The woman's pain was fantastically severe. She felt as if her brain was going to fall apart. The veins in her head throbbed, pounded and hammered. She endured all of it with patience, simply watching the pain. Soon, a great heat began to emanate from her body. She emanated and radiated a great fire. Finally, she overcame all these sensations and everything became still and calm. She had won the battle. Her high blood pressure was completely cured and she never again had to take medicines for this disease. Other diseases and don't forget liberation. I have witnessed cures for impacted intestines uterine fibroids, heart disease, cancer, and more. There is no guarantee of this outcome, though I hope the stories are inspiring to you. Nonetheless, if a yogi is ardent, persistent, heroic, and courageous in trying to be mindful of pain sensations, that arise from diseases or old injuries, he or she may find a miraculous recovery from these troubles. Persistent effort carries a great possibility. Satipatthana meditation is perhaps specially useful for cancer patients. Cancer is terrible. There is so much suffering both in the body and in the mind. One who is versed in Satipatthana meditation can lighten his or her burden by being mindful of pain, no matter how dire. He or she can die a peaceful death, perfectly and impeccably, mindful of just the pain. This kind of death is good and noble. May you make full use of the knowledge you have gained through this exposition on the seven factors of enlightenment. May you cultivate each factor starting from mindfulness and finishing with equanimity so that you can become a fully liberated being.